our series on marriage, Genesis 3 says, we leave father and mother, we cleave unto our wife, and each together becomes one flesh. Now, when we hear that term one flesh, that sounds easy enough. And we have a tendency to automatically hear that one flesh thing and say, that's the fun part. That's the physical thing. That's the sexual side. That's the sexual union in marriage. That's easy. That's fun. That's the way America looks at it. But the Hebrew mind, when it says become one flesh, it's talking about a lot more complex issues. It's talking about becoming one completely. And that's one in dreams, one in hopes, one in desires, one in plans. It's the maleness and the femaleness coming back together again. And I want you to note that it doesn't say you are one flesh. It says you will become one flesh. One flesh. That is an action word that continues to go on. We are constantly in the process of becoming. Becoming, learning, growing, becoming one flesh. And as I pursued this idea of one, becoming one, I, I found scriptures, I found things, and every time I tried to, to push head with that, uh, I just really felt the Lord said that I'm supposed to share some things today uh, of lessons that Michelle and I have learned uh, about, about becoming one. And I'm a slower learner than she is. Michelle and I got married 42 years ago, we'll be 43 this July. And when we got married, let me tell you, we had no earthly or heavenly idea what we were walking into. I, I mean it. We, 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 we helped you. You talked to him, I didn't. Um, I'm confident, very confident, that we loved each other. But at 19 and 20, <laughs> we really didn't have a clue what loving each other meant. But more importantly, we didn't have a clue of what love would extract from us over the next 40 plus years. There was no um, formal pre-marriage counseling for us. Shell went to see James Dyer, uh, an incredible man of God in the Atlanta area, Southwest Christian Church. But for most Bible college students, there wasn't any pre-marriage counseling. I guess we thought and everybody else thought, hey, they're in Bible college, they're taking college Christian classes all the time, so they're getting this stuff, they, they know it, and it's the old adage, I guess because we were getting married in McDonald's, we thought we were hamburgers. So um, we, we didn't go through some of that learning part. We were married the summer between our sophomore and our junior years in college. Uh, Atlanta Christian College, July 21st, 1973. We got married, went on a few-day honeymoon, came back. And uh, it, it had been kind of a tumultuous um, courtship, dating. Uh, two, I know you can't tell by looking at us, but two strong-willed, independent people. In fact, I won't go into details, but we, we decided to call off our wedding um, one week before Valentine's Day, and um, we, were, we were nominated as ideal couple. <laughs> and, and we called off our wedding. And as the Lord would have it, since the voting had already taken place, we were elected ideal boy and ideal girl, and we had called off our wedding. Interesting days. Yeah. Interesting days. But when we got married... We went on the honeymoon, we came back. She immediately went back to work as a lifeguard at Christian City Children's Home. And I went to two straight weeks of Christian service camp. Went the first week from Sunday afternoon to late Friday night to, to, to minister with and to junior high students. Came back late Friday night, spent the night, stayed home Saturday in a little garage apartment that we moved into because our, our apartment on campus wasn't ready for us yet. And uh, Sunday after church, went back to another week of camp. And I can remember very vividly in that little garage apartment, got home late Friday night, woke up Saturday morning. I've always been an early riser, so I've always gotten up before Michelle. And uh, I can remember waking up 
rolling over in the bed, and I had my head propped up on, my el- on the elbow, on the pillow, looking at the most beautiful woman in my world, and all of a sudden, this thought hit me. What have I done? <laughs> thought number two. What has she convinced me to do? And thought number three, what have we gotten ourselves into? And I literally jumped up out of bed, ran into that little eat-in kitchen, and was, I can't even remember now whether I was fixing coffee or drinking juice or something, but my mind was just racing. I'm going, good night. Whoa, whoa, whoa. It, it really had sunk in to me. I mean... We were both, listen, and here's why. I knew I loved her, but here's why. We were both full-time students in college. Due to an oversight by my advisor, my academic advisor, I I was looking forward to coasting my junior and senior years with 14 or 15 hours like most juniors and seniors do. But wrong, oh, tiny one. My advisor found out we had made a little mistake in one of the couple of classes I'd chosen. So my junior and senior year, I had to take 18 or 19 hours per semester, and one semester I had to take 20 hours. And so I'm I'm looking at this, and I'm going, we're, we're both... I travel for the school, we both travel for the school, we speak, we sing, we, we do different things. She was, we're both still in choir, she was still a class officer, she shall, still traveled initially with the Minstrels, which is a singing group for the college, that's really how we met. I was co-captain of the basketball team, vice president of the uh, uh, fraternity, and, and all in all, we were kind of busy. And, and re- listen, reality hit this old country boy, I was looking at that going, Man, there's no exit strategy. There is no plan B. There is no escape hatch. We're in this thing for life. We've been married over 40 years now. 42, working on 43. And things have not always been easy. And most of you can probably understand that. I I know I'm not the easiest person to live with. I I grasp that. I understand that. But this is what I can say standing before you this morning. This beautiful woman is my soulmate, my best friend. I am so glad that I married her. And I am so glad that we stuck it out when we had opportunities not to. We do not have a perfect marriage, but we've never given up. I didn't bounce some of this stuff off her Thursday night. Jason came home Wednesday. Thursday night, we were sitting in the living room after worship team was over, and we were just kind of chit-chatting and talking and looking at some things. And I know one of the things that our kids have passed on to us through the years is that that our kids have, have felt secure in our marriage. They've never gone to bed at night wondering, are mom and dad going to be together tomorrow? They heard us argue. They knew that we had disagreements, but they knew that there was this inner conviction, this inner commitment that we weren't, we weren't quitting. We weren't giving up, no matter how hard it got. And, and don't read into that. I mean, don't hear that God's faithful to us, but not to you. He was faithful to us because he is always faithful. He is faithful to you, whether you recognize his faithfulness or not. I can tell you there were times that I could not, and I don't think she could, always see his faithfulness in our lives. He has always been faithful. He will always be faithful, even when we're doubtful, even when we're wounded, even when we're brokenhearted, even when we're disappointed or frustrated or you name it. He is faithful. He is faithful. And what I've begun to discover as I've looked at this, and I'm just going to share a couple of things this morning because I believe the Lord is wanting me to just share with you the reality that the years, the difficulties, the stresses have forged us into becoming one. And what we walk through determines, and how we, I guess a better way to put that, how we walk through what we walk through determines what permission God has given to do in our life. So to become one flesh brings up a couple things. First of which is one in heart. And, and I've changed that. I forgot to change it on the sign. I've changed it. To become one in heart really is becoming one one purpose, 
one purpose. I have a principle for you. I ran across this principle about two months ago, shared it with the staff one, one morning in staff uh, planning and breakfast. We, we do breakfast together on Mondays, and we'll talk and plan and share. And, and Jimmy Evans, I believe it was on Marriage Today, made this statement, and it's, you can only stay happily married if the reason that you are married is greater than the stress that you are under. Now, just say all that for a moment and think about it. I want to repeat it. You can only stay happily married if the reason that you are married is greater than the stress that you are under. And let me tell you, you're always going to have stress on your marriage. You are always going to have stress with your marriage. I've, I've had sessions with people that are so happy, they love their marriage, but the stress on their marriage is, is, is this going to last, Pastor? It's up to you. Is the joy, the happiness, it's up to you. And it's not just to one person. It's up to Him. And it's how you walk through what you walk through. You're always going to have stress on your marriage. It's kids or finances or health or in-laws or work. There's always stress on your marriage. So to be happily married, the purpose for our marriage has got to be greater than the stress that we are under. So this is the question that we ask. And you might think this. Here's the question. Why are you married? I see a couple of faces. Guys are going, I've been asking myself. (laughs) Why are you married? I've asked this of couples in pre-marriage counseling, and, and, and I asked them, why are you married? Did, did God put you together? And when I ask that, it's always this goo-goo-eyed, yes, God put us together. And they're looking at each other and I'll say, why? And they'll go, huh? <laughs> you know, to say God put you together is one thing, but to find out the purpose, why did he put you together is a totally different thing. And if we're vague in understanding the purpose of our marriage, when the pressure comes on, and I start questioning them in the marriage, in the pre-marriage time, I'll ask them things like pressuring them. Why, why did you get married? What is the reason? What's the purpose for your marriage? Is? Well, uh, let me, let's just look at the reasons. Well, we, we want to live our life together. Sounds good, right? Sounds good. It's an honest answer. Uh, we want to build a family. Want children, want to be a dad, want to be a mom, because we're soulmates. I've had them tell me to share finances. Soulmates, because we're physically attracted to one another. We're in love. And there's nothing wrong with any of those reasons per se. Nothing wrong with them at all. But remember... You can only stay happily married if the reason that you are married is greater than the stress that you are under right now. So let's just take a moment and let's go back and let's, let's examine some of these reasons, some of these purposes for getting married. So you say, we want to share our lives together. Okay, great. That's great. What happens when you wake up one day and realize that you accidentally married the devil? <laughs> or his ex-wife? And it feels like that at the time. I mean, there's times that hit and and you're under stress. And here's the whole problem. You got married to share your lives together, but all of a sudden you wake up and everything's changed over time. You stop sharing. One of you tries to be dominant. One of you goes into different weird things and you find yourself going, I got married because of this woman. Now all of a sudden this woman is the reason I'm under stress. So if the reason that you got married is not greater than the purpose for your marriage, then that becomes your stress. You can only stay happy married if the reason you're married is greater than the stress that you are under. And if you get married because you want to share your life together, when, when what happens when your spouse is the issue and the reason for your stress? We want to... I've had this reason given to me several times. Actually, we, we want to combine incomes. We, we have financial dreams that we want to share together. And, and that's great. There's nothing wrong with that purpose. But, but what happens when financial pressure sets in and there's nothing to share? 
One of you have lost your job, there's been a financial setback, the crash market crashes, or your finances are the stress that you're under. If that's the reason you got married, then that becomes the, the reason that you, the number one reason for most divorces in everything I could see was financial pressure. Number one reason. So if you got married for financial reasons and now the finances are the stress that you're under, you're going to end up in deep yogurt. And you know what I found to be interesting is this. The, the top three reasons people get married are the top three reasons people are divorcing. I probably jumped ahead. I've, I've, I've had a week and a half to write this, so I've rearranged stuff. So I think, let's go to the next slide. I think that's the one. The top three reasons people are getting married are the top three reasons people are divorcing. We get married for all these reasons, but then the reasons become the stress, and then that's the issue that we have to, we're, we're attracted to each other, we're in love. What happens when you don't feel that way any longer? When the chemistry is not there, when feelings are not there anymore, you fall out of love, or there's physical things that come up, or health issues that come up, or, or job, there's all kinds of things that come up, and you have to understand what happens is one reason like that is compounded by other reasons. The finances, the children problems, the pressure, the work stress, the health issues, they compound upon each other and you have multiple stressors upon your relationship. Relationship, And here's what they do. Listen, this is key. I want you to wrap your head around this. When those pressures, when those stressors hit your marriage, they test the integrity of the reason for your marriage. When all these compounded things come up and listen, loved ones, they're going to come up. Life happens. The rain shines on the just and the unjust. All the, there's all kinds of pressures that come. And when these pressures come up, all they are are the tests that test the integrity for your reason for being married. Why you got married in the first place. And remember, you can only stay married if the reason that you're married is greater than the stress that you are under. I think this happened to Michelle and me at, at different times. We got married for all the right issues, for all the right reasons. We loved each other. We wanted to spend our lives together. We wanted a family and children. We wanted, we wanted uh, all those good reasons, but we still struggled and we still wrestled with feelings and frustrations and all those stressors. There have been plenty of times over the last 42 and a half years of our marriage that either one of us probably could have said, these are reasons enough to divorce. So what kept us from doing that? Why did we stay together? And, and I haven't specifically asked her this, but I think if you would ask either of us, we would say we made our marriage about God. We, we made our marriage about the Lord. We based our marriage upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And the number one reason we are married is to fulfill God's will in our lives. Now here's my question. Remember the principle, you can only stay married if the reason that you're married is greater than the stress that you're under. So here's my question. Is any stress greater than God? No. There is no stress, no problem, no difficulty, no issue that's greater than God. And he is the only reason that is greater than any stress that you can be under. He is the greater reason than money. He is greater than kids. He is greater than the physical issues. He's greater than my job. He's greater than my past. He's greater than my fears of my future. He's greater than any giant. He's greater than any mountain, any problem that you can face. So if you were to ask Michelle and me why we are still married today, we would tell you it's the Lord. And there have been times when each of us found ourselves questioning when we were under pressure. Why did I make a mistake? Did I miss God in this? But if you were to ask either one of us, we would say the purpose of our marriage is we found it's the Lord. And because He is the purpose for our marriage, it is His responsibility in us to keep our marriage alive and to keep our marriage well. And that he provides everything that we need 
to keep our marriage vital and exciting because there is no problem, no stress, no difficulty that's bigger than him. He gives us everything we need to keep our relationship, our marriage alive and working, complete with joy, complete with fulfillment, complete with excitement, complete with pleasure, complete with faith, but not minus the stress. If you want to become one, it means that you become one in purpose with the Lord. You're pursuing the same purpose. You're after the same direction. You're after the same meaning. You're after the same reason. And when that happens, neither one of us slip into manipulation or control. And when it happens, it doesn't last very long. We're married to serve one purpose, and that is God's purpose in our life. And everything we do come on, comes underneath that banner. He is our purpose. And you say, well, that's because you are in the ministry. You have to say that. Give me a Pentecostal break. Good night. We are in the ministry only because it is His purpose for us. Only He knows the times that we have begged, desired to walk away from the call. Desired to walk away from the limelight. Desired to walk away from a glass house. You have no idea how often we've begged him, take us out of this calling. But it is his calling. And we have wanted to walk away at times from each other, but never fulfilled that. We always stayed through it. And we've wanted to walk away from the call. But because he is our purpose, we have to do what he calls us to do. And we've said that in the middle of health issues. We've said that in the middle of financial issues. We've said that in the middle of children's issues and their life choices. We've said that in the middle of depression. We've said that in the middle of cancer. We've said that in the middle of death of family. We've said that in the middle of death of dreams and desires. We've said that in the middle of failures and frustrations. We've said that in the middle of good times and in the middle of bad times. And because we have said that, he has been faithful in our ministry. He has been faithful in our health. He has been faithful in our finances. He has been faithful in our children and their life choices. He's been faithful in our depression. He has been faithful in the middle of cancer. He's been faithful in the middle of family deaths. He's been faithful in the middle of broken dreams, in the middle of frustration, in the middle of failure, because he is our purpose and he is our reason. And because he is our reason, he is greater than anything that our marriage would come up against. So one heart, that's an amen. There's one other part that I think he wants me to share, and that is becoming one will. One heart is becoming one purpose and having one will. Let me ask you a question again. How do two very opinionated and very strong-willed people ever come into agreement <laughs> I ran across an illustration that said a young couple had only been married a short time and they were having their difficulties and the wife came back to the husband and she said, I've really been praying about this and this is what I think. I think we need to take three days to pray and fast and seek God's will and let him speak to us about our marriage. So they took three days, prayer and fasting, came back together and the wife looked at the husband and she said, well, I've heard from the Lord. He said he's going to take one of us home and then I'm going to go home and live with my mother. How do you ever become one will? How many of you are married to an opinionated person? Everybody is opinionated. While you were dating, they thought you, you thought they were so sweet and so wonderful. And, and all of a sudden, gosh, they're opinionated. They weren't like that before you were married, right? How can two people, strong, opinionated people, become one will? Michelle was a lot more opinionated after we got married before we were married. <laughs> Listen, here's, here's the key in our minds as to why two strong opinions is not a problem. Because it's not an argument over who's the boss. 
because he's the boss. He is the head. When he's the reason, he is the head of your marriage. He is the head of your marriage. And, and, and we're not trying to beat each other up. We're not trying to convince each other of anything. We're simply trying to find out what it is that he is wanting and how he's, he, he is directing us. And then it's surrendering to his will, not establishing our own over each other. It's about his will being established over both of us. Do we ever butt heads? <laughs> Why do you think I got this big flat spot on the front of my head? As, as Sarah Palin would say, you betcha. But it usually only lasts for a short time before we stop seeking our will and we determine his. We have an accepted policy in our marriage and that is we pray three days before any major decision. We've just always not always, I think that grew in us, but there reached a point in time where together we determined we're going, before we make any major decision, we're going we're to pray and hear from him. And we tried our best to do that. And I really feel, I asked my daughter after first service, I said, I don't want to make this about us, but I know us better than I do anybody else. And I know us about any other marriage. So I just want to share with you part of our experience on how that works and how that happens. Most of you know that when we left here to go to Branson, I was broken hearted. It was difficult for us. We, we, we had a really difficult time. I had a harder time than anyone. And, and we were there for a little over eight years and we, we poured as much as ourselves into it as we could. And, and we finally had to come to the place where we had to close Father's Heart Church and we had to close and shut down Kingdom Heart Ministries, which were two of my dreams. But we did, and we felt God had spoken to Michelle in 2006. In 2006, he told Michelle, you will go full circle. She told me that even though she knew that it would make me mad. Some of you guys came down to Branson. Where's Jer? Jer Gilbert, where are you? He's out of town. There were, there were some guys over a period of eight years that were coming down to Branson to see us, and they would periodically say, you know, we've been having dreams. We've been, we feel like God's saying he's going to move you back to the lake. And I let them know in no uncertain terms, I was never moving back to the lake. Never. Then in 2008, in the middle of a very private, intimate moment with the Lord, he spoke to my heart and he said, Son, you will go back to the lake because you have unfinished business. 2008. And being the man of God and the man of faith that I am, in June of 2010, we moved back to the lake. It took me two years or over to submit to that. Four, four years counting Michelle's word. Father's heart closed. And, and we, had, we had several months. I had left the theater. Jerry Gilbert had graciously given me a job for a while and I worked that, but... After we closed Father's Heart, there was about three months, two to three months, that there literally was no income coming in. God provided in, in amazing ways, but uh, um, that's the position we were in. And, and after about, we made the announcement, we really believed it, and we said, okay, we're going to, we made, told all our friends, Shell, Facebook queen, let everybody know, we're moving back. God told us, were the words we use. God has instructed us. God told us to move back to the lake. And for a couple of months before we got all the move ready, we, we wrestled. But after about two months of struggling, I was given an opportunity to preach on a Sunday for a dear friend. And we appreciated that so much that they would ask us to, to preach. And again, being the man of faith that I am, I'm going, all right, maybe they'll pay me if I come up there and preach because we were just, it was weird. After the service, we were invited into the pastor's study and I'm going, She's going we're going to get a check. <laughs> but instead, the pastor offered me an opportunity to fill the pulpit for, for them for a year. All I had to do was preach while they were busy working on another project they just wanted somebody they felt like they could trust that would fill the pulpit and just preach for a year. Just so happened to include a four-bedroom, three-bath house and a pretty significant salary. And, and we're looking at each other going, uh, can we have three days to pray about it? And as soon as we started talking and praying, we knew that 
the Lord was saying, I'm not that flippant. I wouldn't give you instructions to do one thing and then turn right around and tell you to do something else. And we had to make that decision that to accept this better offer would make it look like the Lord is flippant or that we were just mercenary and we we're going to accept the better offer than the Lord had given us. So we made up our mind and we continued to the lake. And actually, when we first got to the lake, I was, I was, getting, I was getting pretty excited about it. Pastor Mike Byington and Sunlight Church, people there helped us move back up here. Some of you helped us move from Branson by Pier, loaded the truck, and uh, Sunlight provided the truck for us and manpower. And like I said, some of you helped us do that. And they were excited about us coming full circle. And some of you don't know just how full circle it was for us. Uh, when we first moved back, we lived in the same house we lived in while we pastored here in an apartment that I had built for Michelle's mom and dad when he had his stroke. So we were full circle, literally. And then Michelle got invited back to the radio station, full circle. So I'm going, all right, this is going to be good. I'm, ex I'm excited about this. It works to pray for three days. And then three days became a week, one week became two, two became a month, one month became ten, ten months became two years, and, and nothing happened for me. Nothing. I was weed-eating. Ray Rothenberger and I started a, a landscaping business, and we were landscaping. I built cabinets. I cleaned condos. You name it, I did whatever they would offer. And then in the second year, in the spring of the second year, the landscaping business started increasing and we were getting lots of jobs. And then in June, the drought hit. We were living at Ravenwood Circle, man. I was going upstairs and in my, literally above our garage, we had what we called an upper room. We started a Bible study there on Friday nights. It moved to Sunday nights. And, and uh, I grew it down from 50 to about 20. And... Um, we were up there, and I would get in that upper room every day, and Shell put up with it. I would cry. I would call out to the Lord. I was so brokenhearted and broken on the inside. I was just literally devastated in so many ways until I finally sensed him saying to me, Son, it's not about you. It's about me. And you can stay here as long as you want to, if you're bound and determined, you're going to get what you want. And I can remember the afternoon that I laid my head down on the desk. I'll start crying now. And I just said, that's it. I give up. If you intend for me to weed eat for the rest of my life, if you intend for me to clean condos for the rest of my life, I'm not only agreeing with that, I'll be okay with that. We got a phone call from Howard and... Uh, Howard Cordell, many of you, and Tom Manns, they've both preached here. They called. They were going to be in town. They said, we'd like to just touch base with you, see how things are going. I uh, hadn't seen you very much since you came back from Branson. Matter of fact, we hadn't seen him at all, really. So we sat down, and they started talking to me, asking me questions about why I left, what had happened in us, what, what was going on, if I had forgiven, if I was carrying any bitterness or grudges. And we sat for about two and a half hours in a restaurant, answered all their questions. I hadn't seen them in about five years, and my first thought was, some nerve you got not talking to me for five years, start asking me questions like this. You... But we answered all their questions, did everything we were supposed to do like that. And uh, the next day, well, that night, here's the weird thing. That night, Chris and Jen had been wrestling about leaving the Duttons. And Chris goes home and then goes back to the Duttons to resign. He went back twice. Oh, he tried to leave. Okay, I've slept since then. Um, he, he tried to leave, couldn't, came back, and he, he resigned, and they said, where you're going? He said, I don't know, but I just know the Lord wants me to resign. Got home, and Jennifer said he's on the deck going, what have I done? Oh, no. That happened on Monday night. Tuesday, I got a call from Herod, and Herod said, uh, I'd like to take you and your lovely bride to lunch. We went to lunch, and then uh, we're sitting there, and I like to think I have a poker face, that type of thing, and Herod says, well, I want to have lunch with you because we've been called back to the mission field. Great. 
More power to you. Hope it goes well. We spent, spent some days praying, asking who's supposed to take over the church when we leave. Super. Rub it in. No problem. Because listen, you, you, you think I'm joking, but there were days I yelled at God while I was weed eating and stuff. I'd have to drive by this building, and I was so mad. I, it's like, thank you. Rub my nose in it. Not a problem. I love this. This is fun. Because you, you guys have no idea how much I love this church and, and you people. You have no idea how much I love you. And um, so then the third thing, he says, yep, and after praying for three days, we decided that uh, we want to call you back, you and Michelle back, to be the pastor of the church. It's like, really? Give us three days to pray about it. And then Shell asking, Herod, why did you and Molly and the church feel like it's time to ask us back? And his exact words were, because we could not see a better picture of full circle restoration than for you guys to come back. And my poker face, you can ask show, my poker face that time went. <laughs> Next day we met with, with uh, Hert and with Michael and we had several meetings with them, and when they offered the, the real invitation, the genuine invitation to come back, our answer, even after all that, was give us three days because we want to have one heart, one mind, one spirit, one soul about the decisions that we make. And it had been prophesied, the hair had been prophesied over us. Where's Steve and Carolyn? Steve, you, you, were, you were at the house that, the day... We actually, at the end of three days, we called and said, it had been prophesied over Herod and this church had been prophesied over us that it was going to rain like crazy, that God, it was just going to rain over us. And they can verify the fact. I called, no, Herod called me and said, have you reached a decision? I said, yeah, Herod. I said, we've prayed about it. And we, we believe that this is where God wants us. There was a clap of thunder and it started raining like crazy. Now, why do I tell that to highlight us and our family? No, because I look like a complete idiot through that whole story. It's not fun to tell those stories, but I have to be, have to be transparent. But I'm telling you, when you are one in purpose and you are one in, in will together to surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, he takes anything and everything that the devil throws at you, from cancer to health issues to death of family, death of dreams, whatever the issue is, God takes that and he turns it into incredible good if we'll just learn that he is the reason that is greater than any stress that you have. Have. And when you surrender your will to him, he always takes what the enemy intends for evil and he turns it into incredible good. So in this, I wanted to end this series a little differently, but I really believe this is what God put upon my heart. And we're going we're gonna to end this. Listen, I, I'm trying to tell you, it's about his will. It's about his purposes. And you might be in a place in your marriage right now, you're going, well, Pastor, that's not the reason we got married. Well, you can make it the reason you are married. You do not have to waste one more day chasing after your heart and His will, your will and your purposes over His. Let me tell you, once you commit your life to that person, He will turn it into something amazing if you allow Him to do that. So I'm going to encourage you. We're going, to, we're going to renew our vows in just a moment. We're going to renew our vows. And I will give you the opportunity before the Lord, for whatever reason you got married, if it wasn't to make Him the purpose of your marriage, I want to give you opportunity today to stand up and say, whatever our reason was, our purpose for marriage is Jesus. And we're going to trust you. I'm not saying it's all going to work out. Listen. It, it worked out. It's kind of like that. You've heard me tell the story about the donut shop. The guy was on a diet and he walked in. He'd been doing so well, walked in, had a, a dozen chocolate covered donuts and the people he was working with said, I thought you were on a diet. He said, I am. I am, but I prayed about it. And I said, God, if you give me a parking place right in front of that donut shop, I will get me some donuts. And he did. On my eighth time around the block, there was the parking place. 
right in front. Let me tell you, when you make up your mind, he's your reason, he's your purpose, he will, he will provide that, paper, that parking place in front of your dream marriage first time around the block. It might not be the donut you initially thought you were going to get, but he will turn it into the most amazing thing from his hand when you do it his way. Remember the subtitle to the book. What if God gave us marriage to make us holy instead of happy? But you get it all when you're living under his purposes. So, here's what I want you to do. Couples... If you want to participate in this, if you would stand up. Hopefully you're sitting near each other. You'll stand up, turn and face each other. Join right hands. Come here. We're going to, uh, we're going to renew our vows. Now, I can't say all of your names individually because I'm going through this too. I'm going to say, I, Jerry, take you, Michelle, or affirm you, Michelle, and you're going to say, I affirm, we're going to do husbands first. Are you with me? Any questions? Okay. Take the hand of God's gift to you, and I want you to repeat after me. I, Jerry, affirm you, Michelle, as a gift from God. I joyfully receive you as my joint heir, my wife, to have and to hold from this day forward, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish from this day forward, till death do us part. Before the Lord, I give you my promise. Now then, ladies, if you would respond to your husband. I, Michelle, affirm you, Jerry. I, Michelle, affirm you, Jerry. As a gift from God. As a gift from God. I joyfully receive you. I joyfully receive you. As my joint heir, my husband. As my joint heir, my husband. To have and to hold. To have and to hold. From this day forward. For better, for worse, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, <laughs> to love and to cherish, to love and to cherish. From, this day forward, from this day forward, till death do us part, till death do us part. Before the Lord, before the Lord, I give you my promise. I give you my promise. Now you may kiss your bride. Okay, you can be seated. Yeah, I'll be down just now. One of the uh, one of the first acts that we do in a lot of marriages is um, sharing of communion. Um, it's very symbolic, since the first it's I believe the first thing that we will do once we've entered into the Lord's presence in heaven because it talks about the wedding feast of the Lamb when we first get into heaven it's the wedding feast of the Lamb Jesus gave us this meal on the night he was betrayed and he he told us to do this in remembrance of him until he returned he said this do in my memory and you will be making a statement in essence he said before a watching spiritual world Part of his purpose for husband and wife is to bring oneness in this meal, but it's not just for husbands and wives. It's for the greater body of Christ. It's an exciting thing to think about that right now, around this community, there are different churches taking communion right now. Not only that, this is Sunday, so there's people around the world right now, all day long, that will be taking communion. Different, separated, apart 
but one in the presence of God. I looked up the word one, and one has uh, two definitions for the word. The first one is singular, separate, or alone, such as there is only one cookie left in the box. Single, separate, alone. But there is another definition for that word, and it is joined together in unity. A definition of one that doesn't mean singular, but plural. Many members becoming together to be one. One in purpose, one in unity, one with the same goals. That's what we celebrate this morning. We are one in Christ, and we are one with every believer in Yeshua HaMashiach around the world. But we are also one together as husband and wife in Christ. I want to close with this. I use this... uh, use this little picture at times in uh, counseling. It's lovingly a man by the name of Walter Trobish back either the late 1800s, early 1900s, I believe it is. Walter Trobish was a pastor counselor and he came up with, with this little thing and it's lovingly called, you ready for this? The Trobish Triangle. Okay? So I will ask people periodically. Here is a triangle. What can you do to get these two points closer together without hurting the original shape of the triangle? And I've sat with people and they've tried to move them over, but every time you move A over to B or B over to A, the perfect shape of the triangle is changed. The only way to get point A and point B closer together and keep the original intended shape of the triangle is when each one moves up together closer to the point. And here's the point. God is the purpose of our marriage. And when husband and wife in their own hearts determine that they're going to get closer to the Lord, as they go up this triangle together, they get closer and closer and closer together without damaging the original shape, purpose, or picture of the marriage. So as we take communion today, I would like for that to be your picture in your mind. This is the first step of getting closer to each other because you're going to begin a journey getting closer to Him. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before You this morning. I thank You for the unique privilege that it's been to preach and to teach and to share on marriage. That it is a covenant, it is not a contract. And that You created men with very specific needs and You created women with very specific but different needs. But it's your plan and your purpose that as husband and wife grow closer together to you, they will have the most amazing, incredible picture, purpose, and shape of their marriage relationship because it's based upon you. As we take this communion this morning, Father, I ask that you would bless it as you bless the unions in this place. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.